Meditations with Ryan Slomack. The number today is five. Five is the number. We're on episode five. What do you get when you do five episodes of a podcast where you just spend time talking with people? Well, you get really cool guests like today's guest. On today's episode, we have the one, the only Mark Silk. Mark Silk is a voice actor based in the UK. He is the voice of Bob the Builder in the US, or at least he was for about 10 years. He uh, has clucked in your life, if you've ever watched the movie Chicken Run, where he played a bunch of various chickens. He was in uh, a little movie called Star Wars Episode One, which was directed by some guy named George Lucas. I guess people are kind of into him, but today's conversation is a really fun one where Mark gets to talk about his family and his upbringing and his sort of history with audio recording technology, his dad's uh, just brief and interesting sweep with Hollywood, uh, and just the nature of the audio business and the way in which if you put something you want into the world, uh, other people might notice it, and uh, eventually you might find yourself in the Netherlands, just like Mark did. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Without further ado, here is the one, the only, Mark Silk. Cool. So, uh, Mark, thanks for uh, thanks for beaming in today. Where where are you located? Where are you coming from? I'm in beautiful downtown Birmingham, in the heart of the UK. Well, I'm actually in Sully Hall. It's about it's about a ten minute train right outside of Birmingham. But yeah, if you look at a map of of uh, the UK, put your finger right in the middle. That's pretty much where I am. It's a very ha- very handily accessible. Only ten minutes from the local airport. Well, I like the fact that we talked about this before, but uh, we're both centrally located. You're uh, in the center of the UK. I'm in yeah. Syracuse in the center of New York State. Uh, it's pr- very useful. It, it's useful in this kind of, you know, uh, we revolve around the sun or, you know, the rest of the state revolves around me and the rest of the UK revolves around you. So it just it it keeps true. our egos nice and tiny. <laughs> It's also very useful for things like traveling to London. It's about an hour and 10 minutes on the train. Uh, same with, you know, Manchester or Edinburgh is only a few hours away. The, the, and the local airport, when I go to beautiful downtown Syracuse International Airport, is only, it's only 10 minutes away from here. So it's, it's a really handy location. Come visit. You know you want to. You know it makes sense. And I'm sorry, what's the name of the airport? It's it's Birmingham, Birmingham International Airport, BHX. I think you said Syracuse International Airport, which is... Well, no, it's, it's the one in Syracuse is, Oh, yeah. there is, yes, because we fly to Canada. <laughs> That's what makes us international, is we can go yeah. uh, three hours north. Um, so one thing I was really curious about is that, uh, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but in sort of researching you and knowing you, um, is that Birmingham has always sort of been your mainstay. It's been where you've kind of grown up and... and yeah. uh, where you've chosen to reside. What is it about the nature of Birmingham that has made you want to just sort of stay there and call it home? I th- well, for, for starters, my, my family were always here. So um, I grew up literally 15 minutes away from where I am now. Uh, my my mom is still here and I love being able to just get get in an Uber over to mom's and, and say hi and we're very close. My brother is, is you know, 10 minutes away. My, my friends are here. It's also a fantastic location. It's it's it is so handy to be based here. There's so much going on in the city. We've got this inc- you know, incredible music scene, an incredible music scene, amazing food scene. It's just it's a creatively that there's a, a a bunch of good stuff happening here. And then for traveling around for when I'm doing TV or film or game work, again, it's very easy to get down to London. I do a lot of remote recording from my studio here because it kind of sounds nice. And my background is an engineer. So I've, I'm just, I'm used to being the button guy in the studio. So as a place to be, this suits me incredibly well. You know yourself, just over time, you get, you get the opportunities to, to go live in different places. So I had the chance to go and live in New York or LA or London or Manchester or wherever. And I stay here because it's, there's a thing of, you know, it's what you know. But also, it just works. It works really well for me. So, um, and also, my little pup honey's here, so um, she she likes it. She likes it. Here. Okay, as long as the dog is happy, we know you're making uh, good life decisions. <laughs> Gotta please the pup. So let's. Uh, so as a you know, as a kid growing up in the you know 
I, I think it was the seventies is what they'd call it. Uh, you, you know, uh, your mom, your dad, your brother, what was like the sort of family dynamic life? Like what, what kind of personalities did your, uh, did your family sort of bring to that whole, you know, operation? Well, dad was always, dad was funny and mom was funny. And my, my, my dad, my, my dad worked for British gas. He was a, a manager for British gas and, um, and always loved tech. He loved, he loved great sound. And I remember going to, to you know, hi-fi shops with him and, and he, w- he would always be fascinated by, you know, games consoles or, you know, a brand new Technics turntable or Technics first digital power amp. And, and uh, so I, I was you know, influenced by dad and, and then the, you know, comedically as well, kind of things that dad liked on TV. So I mean, mom, mom was always, because dad would go away to work and mom made the decision to to stay and make sure that we we're okay as kids but again mom was always massively creative so she'd make um you know she'd bring clay in for us to play with or she'd give like a big you know barrel of lego for us to you know, make things from and 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 that we were something that was i think also really influential to me was that they always read to me they always read stories to me from the you know moment of being tiny no, and I remember how important that was to me. And I, I you know, I even like, do you remember like the, the used to, you used to want to buy these, sub, subscribe to magazines. I go to the, the newsstand, the news agent here in the UK, the news store, the magazine shop every week. And there was a magazine over here. God, I haven't thought of this in years called Storyteller. It was a magazine in the UK called Storyteller. And it was one of those where you buy the first, the first edition of it. And you've got this ring binder that then you put the first mag in it and then you wanted to buy all the others to fill your, your ring binder up. But every couple of weeks, you got a new edition and it came with a cassette that kind of dates me, a, a, a cassette of these stories. But I loved it. But the thing, the thing I loved more than anything, it was more than the stories actually that I was interested in. It was the idea of, well, how were these made? Where were these recorded? Because these aren't from because t- these weren't from TV or radio or record. So, who did? Who are these voices? And there's the, you know on the credits at the back of the magazine, it would, it would list a, a recording studio or the engineer, and all these little things went together in terms of stuff I was interested in. But anyway, so mom was always you know, very creative, making things, and supported me what I did even down to I remember I had this fascination with buttons like I as, as in like electronic push buttons so the first job I ever wanted to do was work in an elevator because I loved the idea of, <laughs> of pushing buttons all day and there was a huge there were a number of big department stores here in the city uh, in Birmingham uh, when I was a kid and there were people that were in the elevator that would press the buttons for you and I thought that's the best job in the world. You get to press buttons all day. And so, you know, my, my interest in technology, admittedly, my aspiration was low, but to me, that was the best gig in the world. So it's, it's funny how little things like that stay with you. I remember this one day after seeing, uh, I think it was Queen performing live on, on Top of the Pops, the music show in, here in the UK, and seeing them with you know, microphones and behind the scenes of the studio with microphones. My, uh, my dad saw just how fascinated i was with microphones and studios I was like seven years old and he took me to a, there was a a, a tech place in, like you know, sell musical instruments and things here in the city center and he he they he bought me a broke it was a broken microphone it's like you know a mic that just didn't work but just so i could play with it and we, t- we like taped it around my mom's mic stand so it looked like the one in the studio that i saw on tv it's just little stuff like that that you remember that had this profound influence on things that you're interested in, you know, that, that stay with you. They're, they're evergreen, they're eternal for the rest of your life. But you kind of go, this, these were the foundations or these building blocks of things that are going to come back to be part of your day to day. Weird. Good fun. There's, yeah, there's this like wonderful sort of like compounding interest component of childhood that like when you go through and you reflect on like, Things that at the at the time seemed inconsequential or, or, or something that's just kind of this minor moment where you you look at yourself 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing that I did when I was seven is exactly what I'm doing right now. And that that, you know, 
put in some some little element into me that just grew and grew and grew and eventually evolved into what you're good at. Well, and all these, again, the, these little moments, I, as a kid, again, even now, I, I adored the Muppets. I adored Sesame Street. And, and I always, and again, I, I kind of like magic too. I always enjoyed magic because it was like this special effects, larger than life, this other, you know, what was this other incredible world. But the thing I enjoyed even more than the magic was how it was done how do they do this trick, this illusion? So I, I then thought, well, that's interesting. But but the the the, the 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 mechanism behind that I thought was even more exciting. And so then that led on to me loving, wanting to know how do they do special effects, practical effects, you know, the industrial light and magic documentaries. How do they um, the 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 documentary I hide out of the VHS library more than anything when I, when I was at school was the making of Star Wars. How do they do? And so all these names then that you learn from reading and watching these documentaries about these you know, pioneers in in their craft, people like Ben Burt, the sound design guy from Skywalker Sound, the guy that he's a guy that, you know, you, he's he's kind of legendary now. He's the guy that created the sound of the lightsabers and the laser guns and kind of everything that you've ever heard. You know, Ben Burt created those sounds. And then you look at Industrial Light and Magic and their special effects guys that created all the effects for Star Wars and pretty much, again, everything else. And then um, the, I remember there was one day, there was a documentary called Of Muppets and Men that I saw on TV. And you saw a scene that you were familiar with from The Muppet Show. And then the camera pulls back and you see all these people underneath these Muppets and you go, oh my God, that's how they do it. <laughs> what? How? This is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And then you see Jim Henson and Frank Oz, the performer of Kermit and then, you know, performer of Miss Piggy uh, and Fozzie Bear, you know, just riffing behind the scenes. And it was one of these moments where you go, I think this is what I want to be doing. I think I'm that I want to be doing this. So I, uh, so you go ahead. Yeah. No. So I'm just, I'm curious about, uh, you know, before we move forward and sort of how, how you became the Mark Silk, I'm curious about like, uh, am I know, the Mark Silk? The Mark Silk. This is uh, very, and you got, I, okay. We, you, I got to like bring you around with me like day to day, just to so remind other people of that fact. Yeah. I'm trying to rebrand myself as a hype man. So, you know, I'm starting with the Mark Silk and then eventually I'll, you know, find other clients and, and just do PR. It'll be great. Um, but one of the things I'm curious about is, you know, I've heard you talk about uh, the Of Muppets and Men documentary and the book, which I also have, which is phenomenal. Um, right. And, you know, you talk about kind of like watching that with your mom uh, mm. and, you know, kind of catching those things. I'm curious about your brother because I've never heard about him. Like, is he somebody who also has this sort of passion for deconstructing? Um, you know, it's it seems like it resided with both your parents. Like, did that continue on with the other brother? Well, my brother still loves Star Wars, and he's he's still fascinated by that. My brother's thing growing up was more wrestling, so he was more. I was into like this stuff, and he was more into WWE and WWF. So, um, yeah, our, our we have like similar interests, but we're we were very different characters. But he um, he yeah he still has his his love and affection for Star Wars. When I was over at his. Uh, at his place a little while ago and all, all across his wall are, are loads of I mean, uh, all these uh, I, every, when I do comic cons I'm, I make sure that anyone that I can see that he would be interested in from Star Wars I get them to sign something for him so he's got this whole thing he's got Dave Prowse he's got Kenny Baker and he's got all these you know um, old, uh, Paul who's the who was the performer for Boba Fett and it, it kind of just goes on, you know, but so I make sure that I do everything I can to share that kind of fun with him. But uh, but yeah, we, we're we're very different people, but um, but there is a, a, a shared connection. The other shared connection is that it's his pups um, that, that uh, Honey is the offspring of because my brother has a tiny chihuahua. We had a tiny chihuahua and he has a big beagle. And somehow one day the tiny chihuahua hired a, hired a trampoline and managed to uh, enjoy an evening with the beagle. I mean, the, it's like a pony-sized beagle. So we think it was either trampoline or scaffolding. 
But th- th- honestly, I, I, I'd wanted this dog. I'd wanted a dog for a long time, but it hadn't been the right time for me. And then it was only after traveling to New York more regularly that I saw the quality of life that you saw around, you know, Manhattan and lots of the dog runs and things around there, like in Union Square or Madison Square Park. And I, I went around to my brother's when I when I heard that his his two dogs had had pups. I went around for a test drive, and with these five beautiful little pups the size of your hand. And I picked up these two pups. There was a little black one and a little honey-colored one. And I put them on my lap and the black one carried on sleeping. And the honey-colored one t- woke up, looked at me, went, boop, 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 licked my chin, boop, 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 back to my lap, fell asleep. And I thought, that's it. I have been chosen. So it's thanks to my brother that, um, that, that I have this amazing friend in my life, Honey the Cheagle, half Chihuahua, half Beagle. And uh, and she's currently asleep. Every now and then, you might hear her snoring because she is. Uh, yeah, she's just, she's snoring snoring right now. But yeah, I I was I can say of all the things I was expecting in this interview, the honey the pup origin story was not one of them. So that's wonderful. <laughs> and I will also just chime in that uh, I would argue that uh, there probably is some uh, overlap between the uh, the Muppet Show and WWE. You know, I think there's, I there's, think there's just... a lot of yeah, there's a lot of overlap between that. Here's another thing, right? And again, it's lovely when I can find a way of sharing what I get involved with with my brother. So here's an unusual one. A friend of mine introduced me to uh, a friend of his who is a world class um, anim- a stop motion animator. So my friend Tim. Tim Allen, he's animated for Frank and Weenie and Fantastic Mr. Fox and Corpse Bride and Isle of Dogs. And he worked, he was part of the team that won the Oscar for Pinocchio recently. So, yeah, so Tim's sister is a wrestler. A friend of theirs is a is someone called uh, called George Smith. And anyway, we all got together and we, 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 I'm, I'm, we're all good friends now and have been for years. So, uh, we, uh, and Georgia does bits of presenting and, you know, she's got, she's in the States and, um, you know, she kind of knows people like you do. You just kind of happen to know people. This one Christmas, I got a message from her saying, oh, you know, Merry Christmas. And I just send a message back saying, uh, hi, from my kitchen. And she said, oh, I'm in a friend's kitchen. And she shows me this picture of her in a friend's kitchen standing next to her friend who happened to be The Rock. Just in like a rocks there. Just Dwayne Johnson. Johnson hanging out. He's just there. Well, of course he is. Anyway, so um, her dad, Georgia Smith's dad, was a famous British wrestler called the British Bulldog. Uh, now, as far as I'm aware, you're going to there, there's a whole like resurgence of interest in what uh, in, in this you know legendary British wrestler wrestler. So I'm sure all the pop co figures will be coming out soon. Um, and then my, my the brother connection. Her uncle is Brett the Hitman Hart. <laughs> right. By the way, if you're not a wrestling fan, I apologize for this bit of conversation. If you are, no apologies. It's kind of cool. So Brett the Hitman Hart, a very famous wrestler in WWE, WWF um, lore, um, he came to the UK to do a a talking tour. So I um, arranged for my brother to come and have dinner on the table with with the family and meet Brett the Hitman Hart and all that stuff. So again, it's, it's lovely the fact that you can kind of make those connections and make it a bit extra fun for the family. I love it. And I'm going to I want to stay on your family for one more question. And I hope that this is this is acceptable to talk about. But uh, just your relationship with your dad, I find really interesting. He yeah. he was an amputee um, yes. and, you know, worked for uh, worked for the gas company. Someone who's really interested in sort of deconstructing. But he also had his own sort of Hollywood moment. He was the stand in for Charlton Heston for uh, the 1990 Treasure Island. Is that correct? You've done some amazing research here. Look at this. I, I honestly, you get extra bonus points to this, right? Uh, yeah. So, Dad. I mean, again, it's funny as well how I think your outlook on the world is shaped by you know how you your your day to day life as a as a kid. So, to me, Dad was just Dad. I mean, he he just happened to take his leg off, you know, his artificial leg off at night and put it up against the you know the the, the nightstand. Um. So yeah. So D- Dad was an amputee. So, so Dad had an artificial left um, limb from the knee downwards. And you wouldn't even have known, you know, there were people when dad, when dad retired, 
when dad, it was his leaving do, um, and people found out about this special moment that, that I'll tell you about, there were lots of people that didn't even know that he was disabled, you know, because he just he just wanted to have a regular life. He wore an artificial limb, limb with trousers and got on with his day. You know, he wasn't the thing he identified himself with until <clears throat> uh, this happened. So dad was really, he loved sport. And he became part of the, um, he ended up being part, he played archery. And when I was at school, he took, he like, he like took me with him to play archery. No one needs me playing archery. But, but, you know, but I, I got okay. I got okay. And, you know, I did not really want what I wanted to do, but I just wanted to be there with dad. Anyway, dad went on to be in the European Disabled Olympics, uh, games, the European Games. Uh, and, uh, he did really well. <laughs> he did great. And so anyway, it was very exciting for him to be part of that. And, and then this amazing thing happened. If you're on a register uh, that you are part of that group of people, uh, he, he ended up being on this register. And my mom got a phone call in like sort of summer 1989, 89, uh, saying, hello, this is, this is, it, well, but it, it was, it was, it was Pinewood Studios calling, Pinewood Studios phoning my mom, S someone from there saying that Charlton Heston was doing a remake of Treasure Island, and they needed a stunt double to uh, be for like background for when you see Charlton when you see Long John Silver walk away from the camera. This is before CGI, so. If you're in front of a camera, you can strap your leg up and make it look like you only have one leg. Uh, whereas, you know, proper pirate. Whereas if you're walking away from the camera, you would see that. So they needed a stunt double. They, they needed a double for Charlton Heston. And they found from this register in, in the UK that my dad was the only person they had found in the world that matched his height and his stature and all, uh, and, um, resemblance and and also where the leg was missing in the right place and so my mom went my mom took this phone call you know it's, it's so funny you say hello it's 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 plywood studios we'd like you to be a stunt double for charlton heston and she went gordon is that you <laughs> and of course how the how how do you prove this is even real so dad comes home and she tells him they think it's a joke they 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 phoned this number back and in the end, they go down for a meeting at, at Pinewood Studios, and it was completely legit. It was Fraser Heston, his son, making this um, new movie, uh, Treasure Island, which was called Devil's Treasure on when it kept, first came out over here. Uh, and um, it was it starred Oliver Reed, Christian Bale, Pete Pufflesweight, Clive Woods, uh, this like <laughs> these English acting legends. And um, in the end, Dad went for a costume fitting. He met Charlton Heston. Uh, they at, at Pinewood Studios. They had lunch in this beautiful, like outdoor, like gazebo atrium thing. And um, <clears throat> they, <laughs> they, Christopher Lee came and sat down uh, in my mom's place when she went off to get a salad. And Charlton Heston said, oh, "Sorry, Chris, and sitting there." And you go, think, of course she is. You know? And so there's this amazing thing happened. So my dad obviously went through this thing where, you know, he had lost his leg before I was around. And then that got turned into the, the most incredible moment, you know, an, an incredible moment for his, in his life, where he ended up going out to Jamaica for a month, filming Treasure Island with Charlton Heston, Christian Bale, uh, Peter Pothos Wait, this amazing crew of stunt men, this amazing, you know, this, it, was, it was stunning. They even blew him up. They, 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 they said, Would you do this? We want you to do a little stunt for us, uh, Reg. Uh, and my dad's name was Red. Uh, Reginald, actually, Reg. And they said, Look, we, we, there's been a big, big explosion at the top of a hill, and we need, we need Long John Silver to roll down this hill, but we can't do it with with Charlton or a stuntman because you'll see that it, they've got two legs. So would you do it? And they said, yeah, all right. They, they, put, they said, hey, we'll give you an extra hundred pounds if you do. I said, all right, we'll do that. I said, oh, I just rolled down a hill for a hundred pounds. Brilliant. 
Well, they didn't tell him. It was like they were like blowing up Beirut. It was it the the gelignite on, on this explosion was beyond recognition. You know, it was <laughs> so they went okay. So on action, they showed him how to roll properly to be safe. And they said, okay, so just a little explosion, and after three, here we go. Three, two, one, action. And the scene went, boom, and blew up the top of this hill. Like, you know, it was ridiculous. It was this huge explosion of dynamite. And then he went, yeah, and just rolled down this hill. I'm, I'm surprised he made it in one piece. But, yeah, that made it to the film as well. So my dad, the stuntman. It's pretty awesome. I, I also just like the fact that, like, you've got Frazier, uh, who's, who's just like, my dad's not doing that. Like, let's blow up my impromptu dad uh, for right now while his mom's doing publicity. I mean, there's just this yeah. beautiful whole family dynamic there. That's just great. Um, and, then, and, then, and then it was lovely. Uh, I was just finishing off being at school at the time. And um, we got invited to go down to the cast and crew premiere, uh, well, preview of it. And so, um, you know, they were there and, and Christian Bale was there. And, and, and you know, to, to just have that moment when you know, you're still at school, it was pretty exciting for me, pretty exciting for everyone. Well, that's awesome. Well, that's a perfect segue, because one of the things that I also find really fascinating about your career is that, you know, uh, we know the Mark Silk. We're going to emphasize that as a performer. Um, I love and as we talked about prior to this broadcast, that uh, your engineer mindset is still a very important part of your success. Uh, and you started off as an engineer. So like what what was the sort of moment where you knew that get, getting into to audio was the place that you wanted to be? I always, I, it's one of those things where there's lots of things that you know you can probably do, or that I knew I could probably do. You know, I love the idea of being a puppeteer. I was musical. I thought, oh, you know, maybe I was doing bits of music for people. Um, and I think also at the very beginning of my career, I was actually quite shy. You know, you, you kind of, you know, like late teens, you're figuring yourself out. And I liked the idea of just the of being the person that you get your head down, and it's all about the craft of what you do. Um, I didn't have any aspirations to be on stage or be on TV or, you know, do talks or be an event. And now I do a lot of that stuff, you know, just as the, for the nature of what I, what I get up to day to day. But um, I think at the time, I loved the idea of being the button guy. My heroes were people, you know, music producers, um, sound designers. The effects guys, Foley artists, you know, voice actors, these people that are creating these moments, these the you know, the characters, musicians, music editing, all of this stuff fascinated me. So I I I did um internship at a radio station. Well, intern well, two weeks, like work experience basically hanging out at this radio station. And um I I I wrote letters to them trying to just get it getting through the door just to be in the building. And I got turned down again and again and again and again. I have still got the rejection letters. I still got them. And um and eventually I just got back in touch saying, Look, I will do anything. I'll come in any time of day, night, weekends, anything. I don't want any money. I just I'd just love to be there and learn. And they let me in and I ended up being um I my experience basically my duties were filing vinyl records away in the record library. That was it. And then once I'd done that, <clears throat> once that was done, I would then go and watch people host radio shows, watch the DJs. And then the thing I loved more than anything was going in the commercial production studio and watching the engineers work. And then the voice actors, the voiceovers would come in and he'd watch them perform these scripts. And he'd go, oh my, it's that, it's, it's her. That's what she looks like. Or it's that, it's that guy. That's the guy that does the things, you know, and you'd suddenly, you, you'd see behind the scenes of how the whole thing operates. And so I look, I really, my education was, was, was on the job was watching people who I thought were brilliant do their thing. And then when they'd gone, I would go back in the studio. This was back in the days we didn't have to book stuff. You know, once they'd gone, you could just like hang out. And so I would, I taught myself and tried to, uh, and learned to edit and learned how to use the effects racks and how to do all kinds of things that maybe you, they, even they weren't doing at the time. You know, I learned how to like, um, 
that there was a sound that I loved because at the time, just starting out, I um in the in the DJ's in the DJ's office, the presenter's office, there was a magazine by. Uh, there was a radio and records, a billboard magazine, and a, and a thing by a guy called Dan O'Day. And Dan O'Day was based, I think he was based in LA, and he like gave show prep f- to DJs. So if you did a morning show, you'd get like all your morning show gags or This Week in History, or all the, you could get all these services from him. And I found this, um, I found this connection of this place we could buy air checks for him. So basically, I started like I'm, I'm still at school now, right? And I was buying, um, well, I was buying recordings of New York radio and LA radio, of like you know the best DJs, the big number one shows, and also tapes of the production that was being done there, so I could learn. That was my education. So I, I, I invested all my time and effort into this. And so then my influences were so they were really different to what anyone else was doing at the time over here. Because, you know, if you're at school, most people I knew weren't buying, you know, cassettes of radio from New York. You know? So um, so it went from um, it went from me watching people operate in a studio to I started doing music editing and make and creating commercials and promos and, you know, um, um, doing all kinds of jingle mixing and things for them. And then there was every now and then they get a, um, a recording of the American voice guy they used as the imaging voice of the station. And his name was J.R. Nelson. And he, he also worked on my favorite New York station at the time, which was Z100, WHTZ, New York, from the top of the Empire State Building. This is Z100, all this stuff. And uh, so I got to play with these recordings of his voice and do all this stuff to it. And again, so I learned how to, um, you know, manipulate someone's voice and edit it with music and make it sound really cool. And then bit by bit, then I get the other people around. I would just ask, can I record a bit of you and a bit of you? And I would chop it in. And then eventually there was no one around to, to be a voice guy for me. So I taught myself. And then it goes back to what we're saying about of uh, you know influences of the Muppets and influences of I don't know everyone from Robin Williams to Monty Python to uh, you know movie trailer voice guys to Mel Blanc to you know, Doors Butler Don Messick and, and then classic British comedians from over here and you kind of you kind of find your own sound. It's like a musician to me. This is it's kind of all music. Because like you know, character voices, I, I I've I create stacks of character voices now for you know lots of shows and games and things, but it's kind of all music. You know, it, they've all they've all got their own note, they've all got their own rhythm and pitch and all their own little quirks and things, and um, it kind of went from there. So I went from being an engineer to just trying it out for myself, <laughs> and it kind of it turned out okay. What was your uh, what was your first like voice acting gig that you didn't create for yourself? Like the first one where someone sought you out for something or uh, you, you trained well, for it? Well, okay. Well, there were kind of, it's like two parts. The very first one was there was a guy at the radio station I worked at, and they'd heard he this guy went to work in Holland and he took a tape of my work to Radio Netherlands. I didn't yeah, I didn't know what he was gonna do with this tape. Out of the blue, I get this this call from this guy at Radio Netherlands saying they want to bring me in as a production consultant to turn around the sound of their station. And I was like, this, you know, I'm just starting out. And, but it, you, you know, when you're starting out, it's you can often get pigeonholed as you're that guy. And so you'll never be able to fight or you'll never be able to get above that kind of level of work within the place you're working at. Because they always see you as that guy, and you, f- you can almost feel there's a ceiling of what you can achieve being in that building. And suddenly, here's somebody that heard my work for the first time, and they got in touch with me based on the merit of the work, not with any preconceived idea of who I was or you know my standing within that you know role. I was still the work experience kid. But the quality that the work was it was really good. It's better now, but it was pretty good. And so um, they flew me out to Holland and I became this production consultant for like a couple of weeks and, and did this whole package. And and then I thought, well, it was that that was the point when I thought well, I need to be able I need to have my own kit. 
I need to have my own studio toys here. And again, I, I, I just, I was just starting out. I got a little bit of savings. I saved up a thousand pounds by doing wedding videos with my mom and dad's video camera. Seriously. And, but you know what? It was really good. And, um, and again, it's, it's funny, all these little things, they all go together with all the experience you get to get to where you are now. But on this journey, the progress of, of just you know, creativity. And so mom and dad let me sell the family piano and then put that towards these savings. And that's how it came to, you know, a thousand pounds in the end. And we went to a local music store, like a studio store that's, you know, it sold guitars and keyboards and things. And I bought my first microphone and a little mixing desk and, you know, tech toys that you need the absolute bare minimum to record stuff onto. And, um, I, I, and I, I didn't have any, I, I bought a DAT machine, but I needed someone to, to edit on. And I ended up doing um, editing on two VHS hi-fi machines that my dad rented. Because <laughs> on v VHS, the hi-fi track on old VHS machines was pretty good quality. And I found a way to do really good editing on a VHS machine. My golly, this takes me back. So... Um, Anyway, yeah, so it started up. That was the first thing where somebody kind of like noticed me. But then then I did a radio show for a few years. I got offered something on the BBC six months into doing it. They'd been listening on the quiet and I got you know, quietly invited to go down to London to talk to the BBC. I, I declined the gig. I turned it down because I wasn't ready yet. I, well, I, it was too much. I, it was just too much to take on. So I didn't, I didn't do it. I was so grateful for the opportunity, but I didn't do it. I never, I never regret turning it down either. Uh, but then um, I did this radio show for a few years. Then a corporation took over the radio station and ripped the living soul out of what we, we were doing. And I kind of thought, I don't want to do this now. I don't, because it became a job. And I was so grateful to have a job, but I wasn't looking for a job. I, want, I, loved, the, I loved this creative thing I was starting to, to do. And um, they'd taken something that was so wonderful to be part of and just ruined it. You know, they made it so clinical and you were, you were immensely, it, 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 well, it, immediately dispensable. So it wasn't about being creative anymore. It was just about, you know, um, doing radio by numbers. So I thought, I'm going to keep this for a year, then, then leave. And then there was that, that gave me a year to like nurture new work and contacts that kind of stuff and then think what should i be doing really what should i be doing and um i put this list together of dad was always really pragmatic about kind of like figuring out what you should be you know he was always good at making lists and i wrote these two lists and the, the first one was like everything i was good at had some talent for and clearly this was a huge list because i'm just so massively talented and then, and then and that, and that was everything like musician, you know, puppeteer, writer, this, that, that. And then I, then I went back to the list and like, I basically wiped everything off it. And just, it was a more honest list, the honest list of two things. And it was producer and performer, character voice performer. I'd got good at doing character voices. It was still early on, you know, I'm better now, but it was, it was early days. And, and then I wrote this other list of if you could work with absolutely anyone, if you could work with anyone, who would it be? Realistically, reaching for the stars list. And it was Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, um, Lego, uh, Sega, Warner Brothers, Disney, you, you know, na Sony, you, know, you, you name them, all this, all this stuff. And, and it was, it was clearly completely unattainable, but it, it gave me an idea for a connection between what I had some skill with and the kind of world I should be applying that to. And, you know, out of being a producer or a voice actor, I thought, you know what, there's probably better producers than me right now. Engineers, probably, there's probably people that have read the instructions, you know. But I was doing something I thought that was pretty special with the, the character performance side of stuff. It was coming from a different place to what other people were doing at the time. And I thought, this is what I should be doing. It should be full on voice 
acting and, and just focus on just that just that one thing yeah there's all these other things i could still do but really uh, you know to give yourself a, a chance of standing out from whatever one else was doing i thought right i'm going to be your character voice guy and i put this um show reel together oh by the way as a sidetrack that list of all those people that i would love to have worked with the one that was completely unrealistic there's only one name the only name i haven't worked with now on that list is steven spielberg so you yeah, know still still gives me something to shoot for but uh but yeah, and then I, I put this show reel together of showcasing me performing character voices for animation. And most of it was just me copying my heroes, really. Because, you know, when you start out, it's like, like when you're a musician, you, got, you don't know who you are. You don't know what your voice is. All you have when you're starting out is what, who you've been influenced by. So when you start out, whether you're an artist or a musician or, you know, voice actor, you can't, all you have are kind of your heroes and you start off going, doing your version of your heroes. Really? When you start off, you know, if, if you're learning to play the keyboard, when I learned how to play the piano, I was like seven years old. I love Billy Joel. Well, I don't want, I don't want, I don't compose stuff yet. I'm seven. So guess what? I'm playing tracks by Billy Joel. But then same with voice acting. Eventually you might start having a little playing composing your own tunes and that's what it's like with the character voice side of stuff you know it, it started off by me basically recreating work by my heroes as a way of learning but then after a while you, you kind of you got all these other influences and you start to create your own character voices and like with the band you can stay every now and then you can still play a few cover tunes but you go from being the cover band to i'm now the band it's that, you know, and, and you kind of, it, I think that's just sort of like a handy way of explaining the way that creative um, timeline can work. Because there's a lot of comparison between what I do day to day and being a, being a musician or any other kind of artist, really. Well, I mean, looking at your studio right now where I, uh, I don't know, there's like white powder on your desk and some mirrors. Um, and then, uh, you know, just all the other rock star things that are clearly, <laughs> clearly. Yeah, clearly, your, that's, your that's clearly true. Uh, I'm being sarcastic. There are no mirrors or white powder uh, at Mark Soap's uh, behest. <laughs> so really cool. I didn't know that Netherlands story. That's fascinating. Um to just have your tape passed off to become a consultant to help rebrand a network. That's amazing. Um, moving and it broadcast, it broadcast worldwide on satellite and shortwave. So, you know, shortwave, like, it was awful quality, but you could hear what was being said, which and it kind of broadcast, like, around the planet. But you could hear it on, on satellite as well. And it was um, that, that first paycheck I got for Radio Netherlands. I spent the whole thing on more production equipment to help me work better. And as one other little sidetrack, not that we'd ever sidetrack, the guy that sold me that kit was a guy called Richard Taylor. And he became a good friend. You know, I, I just like go hanging out in this studio store, you know, just play him. And then, you know, we became good buddies. And, and, and this, uh, I, this one day, said, oh, come over to the house sometime, just hang out. So um, I went and, you know, over to his house to hang out and he lived with his with his folks and you, you walk up to this building and he go where what is this who are you because it was a big building and on the side of it was a little plaque that said hollick and taylor studio go, what the what and then we go in and then he lived above a recording studio that his dad basically owned at that point and then he introduced me to we walk, we walked past this, this one room which was clearly a huge recording studio with some major tech kit you know very high-end microphones it was like the kind of thing you'd see at abbey road studios in london it was big enough to record a, a band in a, a band and a, a small orchestra in there and so we go upstairs and he, he introduces me to his dad he said he said oh, this is my dad john and i just stopped and went hang on you're john taylor he went, yes I said, you're John, you're Thunderbirds, John Taylor. You're, I said, are you John Taylor that recorded all the sound design for Thunderbirds and Stingray and Captain and uh, Fireball XL5? You went, yes. And it was all done in that building. 
So one of my, my favorite TV shows growing up by Jerry Anderson, it turns out that now my best friend at the time, his dad and his mom were the people involved in the audio design, the sound design of these legendary, these iconic TV shows. And, and now, uh, and at that point, he was working at the studio store, the studio store. And our careers have kind of gone like that, up and up and up around the same time. So, you know, I, I get on, I, I do what I do. And now Rich is a, you know, a, a much sought after musical director that, that goes around working with some really, you know, top bands around the, the world. So, yeah, it was amazing how things turn out. Awesome. And one of the things I just want to go back to as a little aside, because I, I think it's it's timeless, is the fact that a lot of people view that uh, success as this thing where as soon as you you get it, you need to reward yourself. Uh, and I think one of the things that stands out about your story is the fact that you have this success and you're instantly using all those resources, all that money to reinvest in your ability to produce even better work later on. Um, yeah. And I was just talking with some uh, some students who are you know, former students of mine that are creating their own company and they're like, oh, well, we just made this amount from shooting a wedding or from doing this. And the first comment is, well, now we're going to increase our drone videography skills by investing in this and getting certified. It's not, you know, I'm going to buy myself a new car. <laughs> and I think that's really important is to know that that sort of breakout moment where, all right, things are stable. And now I'm going to sit there and live that rock star life as opposed to in the beginning where you're like, yes, success. And then you don't have the resource you need for the next job. Yeah. Well, and, and again, me having this equipment at home, which was really driven by this um, Radio Netherlands job, that allowed me to learn and just get better. It's like if you want to be a really, you know, if, if you want to be a, a good keyboard player, but you don't have a keyboard, it might be worth having a keyboard so you can practice on the keyboard. So this uh, this initial um, recording equipment that I bought, um, that ended up being on mom and dad's dining table. So I was given this room. It was the dining studio. <laughs> and that was how I got started. And then eventually, um, when, there was like a, I remember there was a day when, stuff stuff started going really well it was getting really it, I, it, there was clearly some interest in what i did and then i needed to it was uh, the call waiting went for, literally for 15 minutes in a row of people phoning booking me every every time i picked the phone up you'd be on the, the phone with somebody and then before that call had finished somebody else was phoning to book me for a call it was like that kind of that moment in the movies where everything works out fine for the person it, th this is the time this is the moment and at that point, I thought, Joe, you know I think I need to. I think I need to employ somebody. I need some extra help here, because again, it was all about the standard of the service I was giving. Because if I, if you're paying me for my time, you don't want me answering the phone to somebody about another job. And then, of course, if you went to voicemail, I could miss the important call. So at that point, I started employing. Um, I, I, I got in touch with a friend who was fed up where he was working. I said, "Look, I, I think I think I need to. I think I need you." would you come and work with me and it was, it was a real risk from my side because there was no guarantee it would work out for me just because i wanted it to and i thought what i was doing was okay doesn't mean it'll work but i've employed somebody full-time now since the late 90s and it's that thing where i, I suppose for, and it was it's kind of maybe it was overly simplistic but my my take on it was i'd rather make a little bit less i'd, I'd rather make a little bit less to get a little more and that kind of still holds true now. So yeah. Oh, and, and eventually, just one another on waffling, uh, and then so it went from the dining studio to mom and dad having their garage converted to be another place to work, and then they had their loft converted, so that could be my studio. <laughs> they have That's no awesome. space. Yeah, your parents clearly love you. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I miss Dad like crazy. He was just—it was so wonderful, and he, and he—I'm so glad he got to see me, you know, have some success in waking up to. And and Mom still does, and she's she's still there every step, a step every step of the way. So one of the, I wasn't expecting to talk about technology so much today, but one thing I hadn't really put together is that uh, your career is really starting to to drum up right at the point at which uh, the home video game market is able to cat, you know, is able to utilize voice acting in a way that it hadn't before, yeah. uh, which yeah. I think is, is, is pretty interesting. Cause as you know, I look at your sort of filmography and 
uh, you know, all the different things you've done. You're really doing a lot of interesting video game work, uh, you know, before things kind of kick off with Chicken Run and Star Wars. Uh, yeah. You know, you did Medieval, uh, you know, Ge- my Gex 3 was my favorite one to go through and see in there. Uh, <laughs> for anybody who's unfamiliar with the Gex series, it's a gecko who's obsessed with uh, pop culture and is very, very sassy. It's it's voiced by the comedian Dana Gould. Uh, and in Gex 3, he's got this uh, this little sidekick named Alfred, who is uh, voiced by the one and only Mark Silk to, to give, additional, yeah, give additional, uh, you know, comment about how you should play the game. Um, but how as those calls are coming in, uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're hiring somebody and and, and things are kind of taken off. What was the work where you found the most excitement, and the most enthusiasm? Clearly, there's a lot of video game work. There's a lot of animation work, uh, the motion pictures and the more you know, the, the more devoted animation stuff's coming down the line. Mid 90s, late 90s. What's getting you stoked? Oh my god! I I, I adored I, I, as a again gr- growing up. I loved the work of Cosgrove Hall. So Cosgrove Hall Studios of the UK. That that they were like our Han- The closest comparison would be they were our Hanna Barbera. So Hanna Barbera. Any any Saturday morning cartoon you saw pr- pretty much had Hanna Barbera's name on it. Everything from Scooby Doo to the Jetsons to Flintstones to name it, it was them. Well, over here there were so many famous cartoons that came up from the Hanna Barbera stable. And you know, Danger Mouse was probably one of the most famous ones, as along with along with Count Ducula, Wind in the Willows, Chilton and the Wheelies. There were, there were, and they did animation for a thing called Captain Kremen, which was a animation short by by like on a very famous English co- comedian producer, um, comedy genius called Kenny Everett. But basically, Cosgrove Hall films were some of that I had uh, so much respect for, and they did a lot of stop motion animation as well. So my first break into animation was was with Cosgrove Hall Studios and really early on to be working with in my eyes it was the best of the best and this is before Ardman really went you know full uh, global success of the chicken run so I got to work with them so that that was very exciting to be part of that and then uh, not long after that there was there was you know I got a call for to <laughs> to uh, audition for Tri- chicken run so I find myself in, in, in my studio in mom and dad's place going bark, 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 as you know like you do and then long not long after that it, I got uh, the casting call for Star Wars so in terms of excitement that was pretty good and to end up working with George Lucas at Abbey, Abbey Road Studios in the Penthouse Studio ended up being part of the Star Wars legacy. That was kind of exciting, you know. And then it kind of it kind of continued from there. Cartoon Network happened for me, ended up becoming the voice of Johnny Bravo for the UK uh, and Europe, and then started. Then I I started getting brought in to perform Scooby Doo and Shaggy for the UK and Europe. So. This is like all this stuff that you spend time like dreaming about as a kid or just or at least being fascinated by. Um, I think that was that was more for me. It wasn't like I dreamt of being doing that. I was just fascinated with them doing it. I just thought they were brilliant and, and wanted to spend time in the like in the room watching them if you could. And, and um, you know, when you're doing what you do, you'll play around and people get to know you can do these things. It doesn't mean you're doing it for work, but they kind of know you could do it if it came to it. And um, I kind of got known that I, it was known, I would play around in studios in between takes. And I, it got known that I could perform Scooby-Doo pretty well um, and Shaggy and, and a lot of others, pretty much anything that Mel Blanc or Doors or domestic did rather or doors butler i could do i could perform it's like it's it's just something you could do i got a good ear and it, it worked out all right but look, it doesn't have an outlet for it it wasn't of any use at that time but you could do it you know um and then cartoon network this one day they 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 got in touch with me saying um because i i sent them a show reel and they said we've never heard of you we have no need for you. We have to meet you. <laughs> and I went down and that was the beginning of, of me with Cartoon Network. And um, I didn't get any work from them for about a year. And then in the late 90s, 
um, I got brought in by the BBC to what well, by Warner Brothers to promote Scooby Doo for the on the on the BBC's national radio show for a whole week, and it was the first time when officially, you know, you find yourself being engaged professionally to perform Scooby Dooby Doo. <laughs> like it's really creepy, Scoob, old pal. Right, Scoob? Yeah, right. <laughs> Scooby Dooby Doo. All this stuff. And, and it's. I found myself then performing more and more stuff for Cartoon Network and being brought in to be everything from Bonnie Rubble to Groupie and uh, the Tweetford. Come on, Betty, let's go to. Hello, you happy people. You know what? I'm happy. You know, I'm feeling kind of hyper, and all these, uh, uh, you know, all, all these character voices that I adored as a kid. I, I kind of find, found myself performing them because they were pretty much all from Warner Brothers or Hanna Barbera. But well, that was lucky. <laughs> and then I got to meet Don Messick. I met Don Messick, the original voice of Scooby Doo, at this art gallery uh, back in '95, I think it was. And over. Th- there on the wall hidden away hidden away there is an original production cell from scooby-doo that don uh, hand signed for me and uh and again it was one of those moments where he's a hero and it was just lovely being able to chat with him about what he gets up to you know however your heroes are it's sometimes it's just it's just nice to be in the room if all i'd have had is the chance just to hear him talk do a talk that would have been enough but it was just, you know, it, it meant a lot to to meet the guy, and, and um, yeah, the, the, those those character voices kind of continued. That's amazing. One of the so, a couple of questions. I want to be mindful of your time. Is that I, you know, now that we're at a place where you know we're recording this through a Zoom call, which is fairly you know common now for voice actors, right? Like this is something oh, that sure. you'll 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 do a lot. But there's also that sort of studio play. Um, I go to a very specific time, which is, uh, you know, you were the voice of Teha and Axmo in Star Wars Episode One, if I yep. understand that correctly. Uh, and you have your glorious story about going in and being offered a potato chip or a crisp, as some might call it, from uh, one George Lucas. Um, and you're in the studio, you're recording, uh, I believe it's Axmo, and you did you did a character play just to kind of get yourself like in the mode to start off right like you didn't record yes. the actual voice like what 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 happened and how do people respond to that i guess is what i'm curious about okay well what you're referring to is i was so nervous because you're in the room with george lucas recording this thing it was kind of a big deal and also it was right at the beginning of my of me doing this so you kind of you gotta you gotta find a way of kind of i don't know getting started somehow you know you, you you walk up to the microphone you got to break break through the silence and so as a way of just i don't know trying to make them laugh i performed the lines on the on the script in front of me as sylvester the cat <laughs> so i'm there going, going full from fuckage the congress of melistair concur with the right honorable delegate for the trade federation the commission must be appointed you are despicable and a few of them laughed, um, but then George Lucas said, uh, "Can we try it again? Like, as, as written, please." <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm not sure whether that was the right thing to have done, but it may it, it kind of helped me get there. And what was like? What was the time like? I I'd heard you talk about the fact that it was it was an animatronic that you were voicing over. It had been filmed in front of a green screen, uh, mm-hmm. and it had just uh, sort of generic audio on 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 top mm-hmm. of it, and you were matching to that. Um, how long were you in the studio that day, and and what were what were the goals within that sort of time period? I was well. I was in. For, I was in for a number of hours. I remember that there was there was quite a while where I sat while the previous performer was performing their stuff, and I didn't know who he was or their character was, and um, it turned out it was Ahmed Best performing more lines for Jar Jar Binks, and um, I you know we didn't really get a chance to say hello or anything, but I've I met Ahmed just before the apocalypse ju- just before the world shut down for covid at a comic con in 2019 and it was so nice to meet him cuz he's just a really nice guy uh, and he has a star wars pinball machine look at that 
So, uh, so we had a we had a number of common threads. So we were in the same building at the same time, and both have a pinball connection. So, um, yeah. What was the question? <laughs> so tell me about like you're you're in the. So it's one of those things where it's been twenty year twenty plus years, and you're known as being the guy who did Axmo. And I'm really curious about just the the procedures and the process of being able to, oh, yes. to hit those moments. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I, I was. <sighs> I was probably there at least half a day. I went back again to record, to re-record some other character called Tay Hao. And it was one of those where a great deal of the time was was actually just was me waiting while they were getting this stuff ready. And I'm glad I did because, you know, sometimes you just want to get on with it and go. I, I was happy staying there all day because they had people, they had these two guys from, from Skywalker Sound sat on the mi- mixing desk recording the current performer that was Ahmed. There was Rick McCallum. He was their producer. Uh, Robin Gerland, the casting director, she was there. And George Lucas was in the room with him. And with and I was there with him as well, um, you know, when it was time to record my stuff. <laughs> it was just exciting. And then in terms of how you, the procedure for how you go about recording this as well, as a backup, there was a little kind of waiting area within the penthouse studio area at Abbey, Abbey Road Studios. And I was sat there and there were two engineers from Abbey Road Studios just hanging around just in case that they needed anything. You know, it was that professional. It was the, the support and the professionalism and, and an approach to here is how you do it right. You know, yeah, it was, a, it was such a, I learned a lot from just watching that. In, in terms of just how they how they capture something and their approach to a recording session at Abbey Road Studios, and then uh, and and again you were saying about the actual procedure of how I was recording, they did it a way that if possible I wouldn't have done it that way. So usually the way you prefer to do it is you perform your your lines first, and then they would animate to that. Or you would perform you'll perform your lines first, and then they would match the animatronics mouth to that. Well, because of just timeline, they hadn't they hadn't cast the voice. They hadn't I hadn't been cast for it until afterward until after they'd shot the animatronic. So they had a guide voice, just a guy on set performing the line that the animatronic was opening and closing his mouth. So what I heard as reference was was the Congress of Malister concur with the right honourable delegate for the Trade Federation? A commission must be appointed. That is the law. So this really kind of you know flat recording, which in one way didn't really matter because it's just there for timing. The only thing was it was it, it was it means that your performance has to be locked in exactly to match what this other guy had already done. So that and it's it's really it's really fast when you when you hear it. I think they've even sped it up on the final film. You hear like the Congress of Malister concur with the right honourable delegate for the Trade Federation. A commission must be appointed. That is the law, uh, which is one of the lines. But it was um, it it was just it it, it was larger than life because you can imagine if you've grown up as a Star Wars fan or been a fan of whatever it might be to be in the room with that person that you've just grown up watching every documentary about and every piece of written information you could find about them to actually like spend the day with them um it was it was it was it was fantastic and it's one of those moments that kind of changes your life because from that point on that instills a lot of trust in you and other people's opinions of what you can do so there's this kind of I remember someone saying to me once, if it was good enough for George Lucas, you're probably good enough for us. <laughs> and that helped a lot. And that even like goes on to other things that I have ended up being involved in. So like, um, do you collect, do you collect, well, I've seen some of the things on your wall there that you collect. And, you know, so it was again, amazingly exciting when Topps Cards in New York, they produced a series of collectible trading cards of my character from Star Wars with my name on it. And so I did this big signing session for them in New York and then another signing session later on for them. And that's opened up like going to comic cons and stacks of stuff. Well, Mark, I, uh, I have a million more questions, but we're going to play the, we'll have to have you back on the show sometime card, uh, because you're stuck with me for life and you're going to have you back on the show sometime. But, uh, I, 
I want to I want to make space for uh, just two quick things. One is, is there any sort of topics or any thoughts that you have in mind or anything that we haven't covered today that you you want to kind of get out there? There's probably two things that are exciting. Um, the, something that, again, just happened um, as a nice surprise and then grew is the voice of the sorting hat for Harry Potter. So back in 2007, uh, there's, I got contacted by a company that makes um, toys, merchandise, and they were, they were creating a talking sorting hat. So, you know, I, I did this thing for them and they liked it. And then lots of other people created talking sorting hats and then... The talking, and, and then what happened was, um, in the original Harry Potter film, Leslie Phillips was the voice of the Sorting Hat, but there was one of the houses that he didn't say. Now, um, what is that? Oh, might have been Ravenclaw, and so they needed the, all of them to be re-recorded. Well, I was asked to be the guy that re-recorded them all, and so this thing has gone on and on and on. So now, if you go to Universal Studios in Hollywood. Orlando, it's and you get sorted by the Sorting Hat. It's me that you'll hear as the voice of the Sorting Hat. I went to the Warner Brothers Studio Tour in Burbank end of last year, and I was sorted by me as the voice of the Sorting Hat, and it's it's incredible because you know you've just you go through the you've just been on the the sets of Batman and you see the stairwell from the opening of Gremlins, and then you go around this tour and you see all the you know the the all the famous movie costumes and then you go to this harry potter set and suddenly you hear yourself blasting through their speakers sorting people and it's you are the voice of the sorting hat and that was a lot of fun and somehow someone figured out that it was me i didn't tell them and this person said excuse me um, there's a whisper going around that you're the voice of the sorting hat is that true and I denied it entirely as the voice of the Sorting Hat. Went, well, let's see. That seems very unlikely. <laughs> That's the kind of thing someone would say in Slytherin, you know. Uh, and and it was that. Of course, the, the the reaction was amazing. So then I get asked. All these people wanted photos and autographs and stuff. And then the people invited me to sit and perform it live in front of everyone. That was kind of fun. But yeah, so that, that keeps on growing. And there's, if you, there's so much merchandise out there now. There's an amazing Hallmark collectible talking sorting hat. And again, it's my voice in it. There's a whole load of stuff. So if you have any kind of talking sorting hat, it's mo more than likely that you're hearing me. Or if so you're uncertain about uh, where you should go in life, you should call Mark Silk so he can sort you into the proper place. I will sort you in my own or in whichever voice you prefer. I will learn how to pr how to uh, perform Ryan's voice and do that and have him on hot keys. And the, the, the other one in terms of is there anything else um, that's um, a nice one to mention? It's really another Star Wars connection. So in October, uh, again, I'm a I'm a huge fan of of the work of John Williams. You know, it's he's kind of <coughs> part of the hello, good girl, honey, we're okay, good girl. Uh, she's also a huge fan of John Williams, clearly. So um, in October, I'm hosting a Star Wars symphony, and it's the the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, and me on stage as your super showbiz host. Uh, performing live at the Royal Albert Hall, so in London. So it, a Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and me live at the Royal Albert Hall on October the 22nd, playing all your favourite tunes from Star Wars. So please come. We're doing, um, it's kind of gone slightly bonkers with the interest in it, which I like a lot. So we're doing two shows now, one in the evening and one in not the evening. Uh, well, there's one at half seven in, uh, at night and the other one's about 3.30, I think. And... I think, I think we, it looks like we might be on track to sell 10,000 tickets. That would be nice. That's 10,000 people who uh, are going to be looking to you, Mark, for, uh, you know, just Star Wars guidance. It's going to be great. <laughs> the pressure, the pressure. Sure. Have you, have you ever heard that, the cantina, uh, the cantina band play live that track from the cantina? I have not. Oh, I mean, I know, I know the track, but I've never heard it played live. It's incredible. And of course, you know, of, of course, hearing the Star Wars overture and hearing, you know, hearing what you're hearing, um, uh, hearing the classic Darth Vader theme being played live and Princess Leia's theme and all these things, even hearing the 20th Century Fox theme played live, 
he's just goosebump inducing but out of everything one of the highlights for me is just hearing the cantina band you know it's only a few musicians out of a whole you know philharmonic orchestra but oh my god it's so much fun you know, and, what, it's, and it's short but when we we did one five years ago at the royal albert hall and again the the turnout the crowd was incredible but um at the end of of that probably more than anything they went nuts they were the crowd went absolutely nuts at that because it's just uh, uh, it's a thrill <laughs> well awesome well mark i can't tell you how much i appreciate you coming on the podcast just to share your story um for anybody who, uh, you know, my guess is that most people in the U.S. will be listening to this, uh, check out Danger Mouse on Netflix. Uh, Mark, <laughs> we didn't share this little factoid, but uh, Mark, tell me if this is correct, is that in season one, you voice 31 different characters. Uh, and right. in, it's true. And in season two, there's 12 more that you add on. Uh, yes. And I watched the... Uh, I watched a couple episodes yesterday, and it's really fun to sit there and just point out, be like, yep, that's Mark. I think that's Mark. <laughs> you could, yeah. Is this your way of saying 31 characters that all sound really similar? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. I just, it's, uh, it, I had a moment. So in the first, in the first episode, there's a, a, a brief news broadcast where there's like a rhinoceros, right? Like who's, who's yeah. doing a news broadcast and it passed me over. And then I was like, wait, I had just had this moment where I was like, rewind, play. That was Mark. Like, yeah. Plus, and you know what we haven't, this is, and we absolutely have to talk again because we haven't talked about pinball or any of the other stuff or me me working on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for Stern Pinball. Nope. And there's, there's, there's so much good going on. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to leave it with two last ones where I just want to see uh, what your reactions are. Cause I was, when I was researching this, the one I just found, which I didn't know this existed, wow. uh, but there's a stop motion show called rocky and the dodos uh yes. where uh one of the things i was most excited about was uh you were working in tandem with william dufries who uh has gone on to do really successful audiobook narrations it's like one of my favorite audiobook narrators uh but a really cool stop motion show obviously geared toward you know uh very very young children um but just lots of antics it was such a fun thing to, to find you as rocky that was well that was the first show i worked on that was by cosgrove hall films and then so yeah so um so bill de Vries, um william, william de Vries, he was such a nice guy and we lost him recently so he's no longer with us but he was such a great guy to work with and then he went on to be the first bob the builder for america and then there was greg proops took over from bill for a few years and then after greg i took over as the voice of bob the builder for nearly a decade so for you know, for america and canada if you grew up with hi bob the builder here can we fix it yes we can come on scoop mark dizzy let's go see ryan that was me bob the builder knows my name bob the builder knows ryan's name come on ryan to join us now come on wendy let's go today we're going to build a concrete bridge which is a real practical skill for a five-year-old right I love it. Well, the other one I wanted to ask you about just because it was it was a TV show. You know, there's there's certain one of the things that I think is beautiful about like Saturday morning cartoons, rest in peace, Saturday morning cartoons, uh, is that there were all these in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s that that come out and they're there and you you watch them and you absorb them and then you flash forward 10 or 15 years and you see something that brings it back but one of the ones that popped up in my research review was legend of the dragon from oh 2005. Uh, wow. yeah what juan chi is your character right yeah juan chi yeah yeah and you were that voice for the entire seat like the entire series yes which was pretty cool uh and it's playing sure it's it's on peacock right now for anybody who wants to watch that at home uh wow. but I was watching an episode where uh it's your your character is dreaming and starts to have nightmares and then all of those nightmares start to tie into the narrative well which is really there fun. is a there's a really uh unusual story about that show so yeah so i performed this character juan chi so it was a very kind of um 
uh, it was I think it was when anime was kind of really starting to have a, a breakout in the UK, uh, a breakout in the UK, and um, that like that, that those kind of stories were, were becoming really popular over here. So I, I got brought in to be this. It was like the comic relief, really, of these very serious characters, and the direction that I had was was like shaggy but really ott so like it was really crazy like this the, so the guy was he's basically like um like half man half monkey was i think was the character so there'd be lots of times when he would jump up on things and roll and spin and you know do monkey like behavior and so you'd hear this guy laugh and he'd go <laughs> the things like that now that's what we did in the original version of all these recordings for the entire season the entire season and i was getting asked to go even like wilder and campy or nuts and whoa come on guys let's go <laughs> now and every session it was more more bigger louder crazier this stuff so then it was all animated all done and they 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 put it in front of a test audience these these kids and they i got a i got a call back for the director saying we got a problem and I went, oh no mr d it's with your character no and i said yeah um we showed this this test audience and they really like it i said oh doesn't sound like much of a problem to me and he said yeah in fact they they like it so much they don't really like the other characters as much they're just kind of like waiting for your character to come back on again it was almost it was distracting from what you're meant to be enjoying because it was so over the top so what they said was they're gonna have to recast the character but they'd like to give me a chance of re-auditioning for my own character so I, so now bear in mind that the direction before was like bonkers crazy in your face loud monkey boy the new director was the, the new direction was matt damon <laughs> matt damon and so i had to f bear in mind it's already animated to what i'd done and you got movements of this character jumping around all over the place going <laughs> and so i'm gonna find a new way of like making it like a really regular guy come on guys let's go okay fine Sh sure you stay there <laughs> finding a way of making these really extreme jumps make sense with Matt Damon as a reference. And so somehow we did it. But I ended up getting contracted to re-record the entire season again with my own voice track, having to match my own voice track for timing. It was incredible. There's something about somebody being like, all right, we want Goodwill Hunting doing gymnastics. <laughs> as a direction that seems a cool little confusing gymnastics. i'd watch that film <laughs> dear ai <laughs> no let's not do that <laughs> no please do not do that um awesome well mark uh thank you so much uh audience at home uh thanks for listening uh i'll have a little out thank you second. audience but um if you're uh, anywhere near London or thinking about a vacation, October Sunday, Sunday, October 22nd at the Royal Albert Hall, John Williams, music from Star Wars with our host, the Mark Silk. You are uh, so good at this. And then additionally, uh, if you're, you know, like me and you have to work that weekend, uh, I would strongly what? encourage you to uh, go through and look at Mark's filmography because there's a bunch of things that I will I will put money on it. You'll discover that Mark has voiced that you didn't know was put together by the Mark Silk. I thought you were going to say, if you're busy that time but and you're working, we recommend you quit your job. <laughs> Try that. I, I will... Uh, I'll have to talk to to the legal department of the Meditations for Ryan's Lomac pod with Meditations with Ryan's Lomac podcast before I make any now. sort of things like that. You know, a very calming voice. Awesome. Well, Mark, thanks again. I truly appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Ryan. It's been really nice chatting. I've really enjoyed it. All right, everybody, you heard it here first. That's the Sorting Hat, and that's his origin story. It was quite nice that the Sorting Hat, uh, you know didn't send me to purgatory i'd say that's quite quite a win uh but in all sincerity it was an absolute joy talking with mark i hope you enjoyed hearing his story hearing about uh his experiences and uh understanding just the way in which sometimes things 
just fall into the glorious land of serendipity and you find your way into a career path doing something that you really love. Every time I talk to him, I just find it really inspiring, and it, it gives me hope that there's more exciting and interesting things out there that I have yet to explore. Speaking of, one of the things that I jumped into this year, and as you quite well know, is podcasting, which means that episode 6 coming up on ac- October 11th, it's probably time for a good meta episode, an episode where we talk about podcasting. I'm going to be joined with not one but two guests. One is going to be Matt Harmon, who is the uh, one of the hosts of Drunkard's Walk, which is a Wikipedia podcast. Fascinating, really cool show with a mix of... Uh, intellectualism and comedy. Also, we're going to have Mariana Ruiz from Impact Driven Entrepreneur, uh, who tied that in with her business and went over 300 episodes, and I think may have a few other things stirring. So if you like what you hear, please tune in on October 11th for our next episode. Equally, come find me online. If you want to see what antics I'm getting up to outside of the studio, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram, the world of Ryan's Lumic, which is at Syracuse Pinheads. Also, You can just leave a review, follow, like, subscribe, and do all the other things that you know just brings joy to a podcaster's heart. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you learned something, and I hope you make space for conversation this week, because you might learn something else. Have a great day.